Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 2022 Daughters of Penelope International Women's Day celebration. We are having a little bit of te technical difficulty, so we're going to change the introductions a little bit. Um, but I would like to introduce our webinar panel. First, I'd like to introduce Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, Ambassador of Greece to the United States, Connie Mortupala, Cultural Attaché at the Greek Embassy in Washington, D.C., our Grand Vice President, Georgette Bologeris, Grand Secretary, Marianthi Trapiti, Grand Treasurer, Margaret Dresis, and Executive Director, Elena Saviolakis. If there is time, I would like to just let you all know, and you would like to ask the ambassador a question, you may ask it in the Q&A area at the bottom of your screen. Vice President Georgette, Secretary Marianthi, and Treasurer Margaret will be monitoring the questions. Welcome again to the Daughters of Penelope International Women's Day celebration. International Women's Day actually started on February 28, 1909, to honor the women who participated in the 1908 garment workers' strike in, the, in New York City. Today, International Women's Day is still a very special day and is celebrated as a national holiday by countries around the world. We celebrate, as I like to call it, our Wonder Woman Day, providing a key moment to celebrate women's achievements. Before we get started, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. As my theme for the year goes, or it says, let's keep our light shining bright, show off our women, and keep celebrating each other. If you believe in yourself and follow your heart, no one can stop you. I read a saying and found it was perfect for today. She believed she could do it and she did. So here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, may we raise them. Happy International Women's Day. So let's get started. Her Excellency Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou has a law degree from the University of Athens Law School as a Fulbright scholar who earned a master's in international relations in law from the University of Pennsylvania. She also studied in the Department of Political Science at the University of Athens. Her Excellency assumed her role as ambassador of Greece to the United States in February of 2020. Her extensive career in the Ministry of Foreign Series has taken her to many posts throughout the world. Most recently, she served as head of the diplomatic cabinet for the prime minister of Greece, head of the European Union rule of law mission in Kosovo, ambassador of Greece to Uruguay and Paraguay, permanent representative of Greece to the European Union, along with numerous other positions. But most impressive, she is the first woman to serve as ambassador to the Greece, of Greece to the United States. Please help me welcome Madam Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou. Thank you, Mr. Bazoukas. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. And please, uh, uh, I, 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 I want to say how happy and how honored I am uh, to be in this webinar today uh, to meet uh, uh, members of the Daughters of Penelope, a very, very old organization of Greek-American women whose contribution to Greek-American life uh, is uh, valuable and has been, has been recognized by all of us. Uh, um, today's International Women's Day is a day to recognize women's achievements. Uh, it's to pay tribute to women. But in my mind, the most important is to uh, encourage younger women to pursue their dreams. Whatever their dreams are, we have uh, to encourage them to go after their dreams uh, and also educate uh, our boys, our sons, our brothers, the younger generation of men uh, to respect uh, and accept a woman as uh, not only as equals, as partners, because in this life we're partners. And uh, it, it is such a wonderful feeling to have a partner in life. Uh, 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 the education is not only to the young girls, it should, has to be towards the young boys as well. Thank you very much. We are so excited to hear about your life. So we have come up with a few questions if you would honor us with answering them and just let us know everything. 
Um, so if you please, we would love if you could share your journey of how you came to be who you are today as the ambassador of Greece to the United States. I think I owe everything to my parents. They're not alive, but um, the fact that they insisted so much on education and also they insisted that, uh, on, that their children, I have a, a younger brother who lives in the United States, uh, their children pursue their dreams uh, and they never made a distinction between a boy and a girl. They never differentiated between myself and my brother. As a matter of fact, every Sunday, when I was growing up in Greece, Saturday was not a, a holiday. We were going to school on Saturday. We were working on Saturday. So every Sunday, we had to help my mother to do the, the house, housework, you know, to clean the house and do everything. And my mother insisted that both my brother and myself do the same. There was not that you do, you help me with the uh, house chores and your brother sits in his room. No, I had to do things and he had to do things. So in my house, uh, uh, in my home, um, there was no distinction, no difference between my brother and myself. We were equally, we were raised with the same amount of love, the same encouragement. Uh, and uh, my parents made sure that both of us uh, had the same opportunities. But above everything else, they gave me this sense uh, that there is no, I'm sex blind, I would say. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or you're a woman. Um, the fact that um, it's your abilities, your drive in life, what you want to achieve, uh, and the fact it, it's very helpful to have a family that supports you. That's very important. But it has nothing to do with whether you're a man or a woman. And this lesson I learned from my parents, and I'm eternally grateful to them. Thank you. So my next question is, who or what event inspired you to cultivate your talents and excel in the foreign service? You know, things come naturally in life. Sometimes uh, you don't really, you know, we, I, I, I have a theory that sometimes life takes you where you're meant to go. Uh, it's not that you wake up one morning and you decide I will become this or I will not become this. Uh, um, I was a very good student uh, uh, and this was a number one cardinal, cardinal rule in my house that you had to be a good student, to be a, a, a very conscientious student. You have, you had to make the best effort you can. That was our job, my brothers and myself, to be very uh, diligent with our st studies. Uh, um, the results whether we were very good or less good, it was secondary. But the effort was what counted for my parents. So I was a very good student. Um, I was diligent. I wanted to, um, to study. Um, I, I don't think I had any choice. That was no choice for my parents. I had to study. I had to go to the university. There was no, uh, I, I didn't have a choice there. And there were a lot of things I wanted to do in life. I like very much architecture. I like like uh, and decoration, de to decorate things. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I adore journalism. And so at some point I decided that maybe I should follow law, uh, go to law school because this offers a bigger variety of choices. Uh, and uh, um, one thing was maybe I'd become a judge, maybe a journalist. And at some point I thought about the foreign service uh, because it offers you a lot of uh, variety. I think uh, what I love in my job is variety. The fact that you don't do every year the same things. Uh, um, there is a basic canvas, uh, a basic fabric of what you do. But then this changes depending on where you serve, uh, the circumstances, uh, and also the specific job you do in every post. Uh, uh, ambassador in the US is different than being permanent representative of Greece to the European Union, is different than being ambassador to Skopje. I was ambassador in North Macedonia as well. Uh, and even uh, you don't start being an ambassador, you start from the very um, low ranks uh, and uh, you can be, uh, you can do consular work, you can do commercial work, you can do uh, press work, uh, you can do political work. Uh, so there is always uh, something to keep your interests uh, alive and uh, something challenging every time. And I think for me, the main, uh, uh, the main attraction to my job is that after 40 plus years of doing this job, I'm still very interested and curious in what comes next. Thank you. It does sound like such an interesting job and you have 
you get to travel, you get to do so many different things. So I could never see it being boring. So no, I, it's not boring, but it has yes. some, <laughs> some side effects. Mm -hmm. Because life cannot, it cannot be easy all the time. Um, it just you have to start all over every three, four years, you start all over. You move from one country to another. So you have to leave behind your friends, uh, your home, your life. And then you start uh, under completely different circumstances, a new life. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're ready for that uh, and you welcome that. But your children are not always ready for that. Uh, so you have to prepare your children. I have a son uh, and still even today, he's 31 years old uh, and he always complains that he never had the chance to have permanent friends. And if you ask him what you want to do in your life, uh, the, the first answer, uh, the first reply is, I don't want to move. <laughs> you know, that was his first, <laughs> that would be his first reply. So it's very hard on the children and on the family. And even uh, on us psychologically, because every place we go, we have, we get, become, uh, have friends uh, and we get attached to the place. And then you have to leave, uh, to leave it behind. And it's not for sure that you will go back. Sometimes you go back, sometimes you don't go back. Uh, so uh, this is, this is not an easy process. Uh, and apart from uh, uh, being uh, seeing so many places and seeing so many people and acquiring so many uh, experiences in life, uh, there is also the side effect uh, that you want some stability occasionally. And uh, a lot of times uh, you have to deal with everyday chores in your work uh, that uh, people do not realize. Uh, like, I remember once I, when I was a pastor in Skopje, one night they called me, the basement was flooded. So you have to go and take care of the flood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it happens. And of course you have to take care of that. Uh, so, so it's not all, always the glamorous part uh, or what you see. It's always a lot of basic work. Um, you know, trying to, to meet the right people and trying to arrange meetings for ministers and uh, uh, accommodate uh, uh, visitors from Greece. And also there is a lot of basic work uh, that is um, rewarding. Yes, uh, it's always rewarding, but it's it's uh, it's uh, it entails a lot of effort and uh, hard work. I can't imagine. So, how do you envision your talents inspiring positive changes for the future through all of your experiences that you've had? How do I envision my? How do you envision your talents to help inspire others for changing the oh. future? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can inspire anybody because everybody should follow his heart. Everybody. This is very important. Uh, the, the, I consider myself very lucky that because I do the job, I always want, I, I wanted to do. In the end, this is what I wanted to do. And uh, this is uh, my true talent. This is my true calling. You know, this is what I want. Uh, this is who I am. So I'm very, very uh, happy and very lucky to do that. Uh, and what I say uh, to my son and I would say to all the younger people, follow your heart. Uh, and in the United States, you are very lucky because you have options. You don't have to decide when you are 10 years old uh, how, what, uh, what kind of job you want to do, uh, to do you know, what kind of path you want to follow. You can always change. Uh, you can always have a second, uh, second thoughts. So uh, it's so hard, it's so painful to spend all your days doing things you hate or you don't like. You have to find satisfaction in what you do. And this is the only, the only advice I give to uh, every younger person who asks me, follow your heart and do things that make, make you feel this kind of fulfillment this feeling of fulfillment, that you do something that makes your days happier and full. That's very good advice. The only one I can give because <laughs> each, each human being is different and each human being has a different reaction to things, to the facts. Uh, 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 all of us view, uh, view the world through our own eyes uh, and all eyes are equally valid uh, and important and precious. Thank you. So the next question we have, if you could give one piece of advice to a potential foreign service officer or to someone who wants to pursue this type of career in diplomacy, what would it be? Patience. 
patience and perseverance. Things do not come easy. I might, I guess, in no job, in no uh, profession, things come easy. There is there are a lot of adverse elements in this job, uh, and uh, you have to be very patient. There a lot of understanding and tolerance, understanding, patience, and perseverance. And, uh, and you have to love people. That's another point. Uh, all of us have good points and bad points. If you focus always on the bad points, you've lost the game. You have to focus on the good points. Every country has beautiful things. to. to, to every, every country has play, people and things and traditions and history to fall in love with, uh, and also people, traditions and history that you don't really like. But you don't have to focus on, on, the, on the negative elements. Uh, uh, you have to find the best in every place you go, enjoy what you have there, even the adversities in every place. Uh, even, I, I, I remember I went to Kosovo during the war to open the Greek liaison office and there was no electricity and there was no the water was coming only for two hours a day. Uh, so so it was very hard life. But on the other hand, uh, you had people fighting uh, for what they believed was right for them. And also a, a lot of internationals were there, extremely interesting people. And you were witness to history. So I focused on that and I forgot the lack of electricity. I said, okay, I'll have electricity when I go back to Greece. <laughs> so what, it was your, what would you say your biggest challenge um, that diplomats or yourself face today? Today, the biggest challenge was COVID because our job is based on human touch, on human interaction. And the fact that we couldn't have it and uh, all our discussions and meetings had to be through Zoom. I don't underestimate the power of technology. And I'm grateful that we had Zoom but Zoom cannot substitute for the real work you do. Uh, when you see people, when you, see, you talk to people through Zoom, especially not on a friendly discussion, but on a business-like discussion, then uh, uh, people are always, uh, they say what they have to say. But when you see them on one-to-one -one basis, uh, you can judge, uh, they can say more things, they can feel more relaxed. Uh, and even sometimes from their body language, you understand more than what they say. Uh, nothing replaces human, uh, human touch, human interaction, human presence, in, in, I think in every part of life, uh, but especially in my job. And this, uh, we were deprived of that. Uh, as we get out of COVID, a lot of this is coming back. Uh, of course, a, a lot will stay with Zoom. Uh, and I understand that sometimes when you have discussions and uh, events, you can have them through Zoom because you can reach out to audiences, uh, uh, to bigger audiences and have bigger participation and speakers from the four corners of the earth that uh, uh, it's not possible when uh, you have a live discussion. But on the other hand, uh, um, I, I hope that people will not resort to Zoom because this saves them time and effort. And I see that a lot because you take, it takes you a lot of time to drive to the office in the morning. Uh, uh, it takes a, a lot of time to get out of the, of the office, to go meet people. It's so much easier to put the Zoom on and you talk and you, do, you think you do your job. In our line of work, you don't do your job like that. And sure. I hope that uh, um, I, I hope that we'll get back to normal. 100%. This is my, this is the biggest challenge uh, that we have regarding COVID. Uh, as far as uh, the rest of, of the work, uh, we live in a very complicated world, really complicated world. Things are not black and white. Uh, nobody can be sure of what's happening tomorrow. We see what's happening as we speak, uh, which I would say never, never, never in my life had, uh, could I have thought that I'll see a war in Europe. I mean, if you told me that, I said, oh, you're crazy, you're dreaming. And never, for me, it was unimaginable, unimaginable. And here we see it and we experience that. So every time they ask me about predictions, I say, look, after that, I will never give an opinion about what's going to happen because I was so off. <laughs> I thought these things do not happen, but they do happen. So we live uh, in a world with a lot of insecurity and a lot of questions. Uh, insecurity because uh, our insecurity is compounded uh, by many factors. We went through a pandemic uh, in Greece, especially, but even now all over the world, we go through economic 
challenges. Uh, and of course, above everything else, so the security challenges of the world that we're facing in Europe. So uh, yes, it's it's a big uh, it's a big hard way ahead of us. Uh, and in in my line of work, I think what we must do above everything else uh, is give diplomacy a chance. Because differences always exist, but you don't solve them through weapons. Uh, diplomacy is the number one means of uh, ironing differences, uh, reaching out to other people and understanding each other. Um, yes, the new world that is emerging now because the war in Ukraine will change all of us will change, uh, there is no way, no matter what the outcome, it will change all of us. Uh, the work in Ukraine presents another big challenge uh, for all of us, but especially the ones in my profession, uh, to re-estate re, uh, re the value of, uh, of diplomacy and uh, make sure that uh, uh, people understand once and for all. I thought we had understood that, but apparently we hadn't, that, uh, war is not an option. We do live in a very complicated world. And I know we all agree with you when it comes to Zoom that we all need to get back to in-person, touching, hugging, talking in person. Um, but yes, you are correct when, I think we all agree when you say that this world has become so complicated. Yes, and not, not only that, I see younger people who are usually, uh, they use this mass communication, social media a lot, uh, and sometimes they sit next to each other and they communicate it with messages. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I cannot help but think, uh, when you send a message, you can say hard things because the message doesn't go to a face. Go, you know, it's paper. But when you see another person face to face and you, he's sitting next to you or she's sitting next to you, it's you know, you have to think twice. You don't want to see the, fa uh, the, the, the hurt you can cause other people. There are many ways to say something. True. One of the things you learn in my job is there are many ways to say something. You can say the hardest things uh, without offending anybody and without uh, uh, humiliating him. And it's very important. I don't say that you cannot, you should not speak your opinion. Of course, you speak your mind, you say your opinion, but you, one has to do that, uh, take into consideration the, others, the other pe person's perspectives and views and feelings. Yes. Thank you so much for answering my questions or our questions. Now I'm going to pass it off to our our three wonderful Grand Lodge officers. I know they've been receiving uh, questions through the, I'm gonna call it through the hotline. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they will go through and ask questions and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Our first question comes from Brother ba Basil Mosaidis and his question to you is, did you find any resistance or discrimination in, the in your time in the Foreign Service? Basil Mercedes is like a brother to me. We, we know each other from Philadelphia times. <laughs> so <laughs> he's a real, real good friend, him and his wife. Um, I, I, although that might disappoint people, no, I didn't face discrimination. Uh, the, a lot of yeah, the, the Greek foreign ministry was very slow in accepting women. The first woman who joined the foreign ministry uh, the, uh, joined the, uh, this company in 1972, if I'm not mistaken. So it was rather, rather late. Uh, and they were very reluctant in the beginning. Uh, I joined the foreign ministry in 81, in August 81, and I was only the 10th or 12th woman to join. Uh, so... Um, they, 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 I, I don't know if it was resistance or it was reluctance or it was a lot of uh, um, thoughts about how women could uh, get uh, included and, uh, uh, and it, it was, they were late. But once we got in there, uh, they, they treated, my male colleagues uh, treated us as equals. We have to understand something about Greek society. Although everybody knows the role of the Greek man, in reality, Greek society is, uh, uh, runs around mothers. Uh, the role of mother in the Greek family is very, very important. The mother, the grandmother. So 
yes, the Greek society was not always open, uh, and sometimes even today, uh, to accept women in positions of power, yes. Uh, but they not, were not ready to accept women in positions of obvious power, not subtle power. Um, so sometimes uh, you have to play with these, uh, uh, these feelings of men. Uh, and not now in Greece, things are completely different, uh, but there are areas in the world uh, that you can always play with that. Uh, um, but uh, the Greek, in the Greek uh, uh, public service, there's no discrimination when it comes to money, the salaries. Uh, um, regardless of um, man or woman, you always get the same salary. In the foreign, uh, in the Greek foreign service, and uh, nobody ever told me, uh, you will not get this job because you're a woman, not even implied that, no, nothing. And uh, just to give you an idea today, uh, the ambassadors of Greece, uh, okay, Washington, Moscow, Berlin, Paris, and UN are women. Just gives you an idea. Some of the most important posts we have, uh, uh, we have women ambassadors uh, and very good colleagues, amazing ladies. Uh, so that, that speaks a lot about uh, uh, how things are developing. Uh, and now almost 35 to 40% of Greek uh, uh, foreign service uh, employees uh, are women, are female. So it, it's very hard to speak about discrimination. I don't, I, 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 let me be very clear. I don't exclude that some colleagues face that. Maybe I was lucky. Not everybody's the same. Um, maybe some older uh, people and some older ambassadors when we joined uh, uh, the foreign service, maybe some others faced the issues of discrimination, but not me. I was perfectly treated, perfectly okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. The next question is, can you comment on the current status of opportunities in the business marketplace for women in Greece. And, that, and this comes from Barbara Wolf. The, the, the progress of, for women in Greece has been amazing, really amazing. Uh, today we have a president of the Republic is a lady. Uh, the, the president of the Greek, uh, we have two Supreme Courts in Greece. It's a different judicial system. The one uh, uh, is a lady, that one is a man, but uh, a year ago, both of them were women. Uh, the judicial uh, judges are, I think, to the 60, 65% are women. Teachers are oh, overwhelmingly female. Uh, so. The, the, the female workforce is strong and thriving in Greece. One might say that, uh, um, yes, there is a glass ceiling. I'm not so sure there is a glass ceiling in the Greek civil service. Where we have to do to, to, to make advances in sometimes in uh, social perceptions and the way that uh, some males think, uh, they think that they can use power to push through their demands. But, you know, we have a lot of males that kill their wives uh, out of jealousy or their daughters or their girlfriends. Uh, we have to educate uh, the males, the, the young boys, uh, that power, strength uh, will not take them any place when it comes to their female companions. Um, I think we have a social problem there. It's not a problem about institutions. It's not a problem about uh, uh, how the civil sex sector uh, accepts a rich woman. It's how uh, the, the, the social perception about power and roles that, uh, in the family and roles in society. And there we have to do a lot of work. Um, it, it, this is our, our, our job now to educate the young boys uh, how to treat women. Because you know, sometimes young, younger men are confused because they moved uh, from one society that told them that they have to protect but women, but protect what, quotation marks. Uh, and now that women are equal, equal, and they don't need protection, protection uh, quest, uh, quotation marks. And they confuse the, the word protection. Protection doesn't mean that you have to beat your wife. Protection, that doesn't mean that you have to uh, have your wife as a second class citizen locked in a house, that you have to impose on your 
wife or daughter or partner or whatever, um, you, 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 you uh, dictate the terms of life. Uh, protect means uh, respect. This confusion is, uh, uh, we have to do a lot uh, in order to make clear that protection means respect. Respect your wife, respect your daughter, respect your sister, respect your mother, respect your female friend, your female co-worker. And there, there is a lot of work that has to be done because sometimes our society in Greece has this macho uh, idea about what the man means. Thank you, Mrs. Madam Ambassador. Our next question comes from our past grand president, Sister Evelyn Siavis, and her question is, what words of wisdom and advice would you give any woman considering seeking leadership roles, not only in government, but within our beloved Daughters of Penelope? Um, I don't know if I can give advice because each woman finds her own way in life. And I, I, I have the, the highest respect for my mother who was a bank employee uh, back in 1956. And then when she married my father who was an army officer, she decided to resign and follow her husband and, and devote herself to her family. And she was always the, the big boss in the house. And I still remember my father getting his salary and giving it to my mother to manage it. So I don't know what mean, uh, what advice you give. They had, uh, and they lived together for almost 40 years, uh, a very happy life together. So I don't know, there is no advice in life. There is no one way to go about life. Each one finds his own way. One cardinal rule for me is to do what your heart tells you to do. I said that in the beginning. If a, a, a woman wants to seek a leadership position and she wants to do that, she really wants to do that, she will find her way how to do that. Uh, if, uh, but she doesn't have to, to follow a leadership position just because somebody told her to do so. If she doesn't want to have a leadership position, she's equally important, equally valuable. We all need, we don't need only generals, we need soldiers too. The value of a person doesn't depend on the position he has or she has, uh, depends on how she treats herself, she presents herself, uh, and how she does what she wants to, da to do in the best way she knows. So I, I, I admire the daughters of Penelope because I think they give a voice to a lot of women. And I, I, I have to say that Greek-American women have to be given a lot of respect because all we have today, our communities, our organizations depend a lot on the, on the very hard work that generations of Greek-American women put in their communities, in their families, in their organizations, in the churches, never getting credit for that, uh, never seeking credit for that, uh, but they're the backbone that keeps this community strong and alive and flourishing. So it's very good that we have organizations that give voice to this woman uh, and allow this woman to, 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 to pursue what the, uh, their interests. And uh, of course, there are many ways to pursue their interests, but it's very good to have organizations uh, to, whom, uh, to which you can belong and do things you want to do. Um, and, uh, uh, but I believe that a, a woman who wants to find her way for leadership position, she will find her way. There is no one way to, 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 to heaven. There are many ways, and, uh, but they have, she has to be herself. We have to be ourselves. Thank you, Mad Madam Ambassador. The next question is a two-part question that comes from Joyce Anagnos. Can you highlight an example when another woman played a significant role in your career path? And do you find that women helping women is a key component of celebrating International Women's Day? The second, yes, I think women should help women and should guide women and should open ways for women uh, uh, to, to, to move forward. But um, I will never push a woman. Uh, for me, the first rule is qualifications. I will never say I will take a woman for this position because she's a woman. No, because this is discrimination. I don't want anybody to tell me that I got my position because I'm a woman. 
I think this is a disservice to me. I got it because I worked hard for that and because my, the leadership of my ministry decided I deserve it, not because I'm a woman. Um, so I don't want to do the same thing to other women. But if uh, uh, there is a qualified woman, yes, I think we should help them. And another point that I, for me, it's a cardinal rule is help women uh, to balance family life and work life. Uh, I think a, a woman can be equally important in her job and, and, and very good in her job and very productive in her job. Uh, and if she has to go two hours early on one day at home because her daughter is sick or her son is sick, uh, it's, not good. it's not the end of the world. doesn't make her a less a, a valuable employee. I mean, some flexibility is important to allow a woman to fulfill all the roles that are expect she expects from herself. Because for me, being a mother is if you want to be a mother. If you don't want to be a mother, it's your choice. But uh, if a woman wants to be a good mother and a good professional, yes, we have to help her. It's showing flexibility. Nobody got hurt because we showed a fl flexibility. And even our work, our job, uh, the embassy here, our work will not be hurt uh, if we show some flexibility to a woman colleague uh, who just has to stay home one day. If she's good and professional and responsible, she will find a way to make up for it. And I have colleagues here in the embassy who are young mothers and they have young children and they're the best of the best. And I have no complaint. They will always fulfill what are uh, uh, their assignments, what they have to do. And sometimes they have to stay or go one hour earlier because uh, uh, the teacher of the kindergarten, something happened. It's not the end of the world. Huh? It's not. We have to be understanding. And the same goes for our male, uh, uh, the male uh, colleagues, uh, who sometimes they have to do that. Uh, because parenting is not a woman's job. Uh, it's, uh, it's both parents' job. Uh, but we understand, especially for very young children, mother's presence is uh, irreplaceable. So yes, we have, to, this is a very important message. Uh, yes, we have to help our, the other women to pursue their dreams and encourage them and tell them that there is no, that the sky is the limit. They can achieve everything, everything in life, uh, as long as they want it. On the other hand, it's their choice. We don't impose choices on them. It's their choice. Whatever they want, whatever makes them happy, whatever makes this, this life is so short. We have to live it in a way that allows us when our, our life is close to the end to say, okay, I had a good life as I wanted it. I don't remember the first question, I'm sorry. The first part of the question. Well, the first part of the question is, can you highlight an example when another woman played a significant role in your path, in your career path? Not one specifically, uh, because I come from a family with very strong women, <laughs> very strong women. So for me, it was not, you know, I tried to explain that for me, it was not anything in particular that I did in life because it was expected for me, from me to do things, you know, so, okay. Um, but there was, there are some women that I really, truly admire really admire um, uh, some uh, amazing uh, ladies. I always admired uh, uh, Gensburg, Judge Gensburg, uh, Ruth Bader Gensburg uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, because uh, uh, not, not, although she was not the first uh, female judge in the Supreme Court, uh, but her judicial work, I was attracted to her judicial work. Uh, I thought she was a, 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 an amazing uh, person. Uh, not anyone in particular, no. Uh, there's a lot of women that I admire, but I admire a lot of men as well. So <laughs> I would say my mother. My mother was the one who I really, I, I had as a model. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Elena, hey. Elena can you um, talk, Elena? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not working. All right, Margaret, can you ask Elena? Absolutely. Something? Absolutely. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Elena has a two part question for you. The first being, what has been the single biggest factor in your success? And her second question is, what advice would you give your younger self? I didn't hear the second one. What advice would you give your younger self? Um, 
the f I, I, the, I think I, I'm very disciplined. That's the, the main, uh, if, I, I, if you ask me why, uh, what is the, the reason, I, uh, whatever I achieve in my life, there are people who achieve many more things. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, there are people who have achieved uh, amazing things in life, but whatever I have achieved, I think I'm very disciplined. Uh, and uh, I put above everything else my sense of duty. This is something that my father taught me. You know, I have uh, a duty to uh, to my family, to my you know. I go to, to, to my to my office, to my to my work every day, and I think the Greek taxpayer pays me to do a job. I cannot. I have to do it because this is what I owe him. This is the minimum I owe. I owe the people who pay my salary. And this is the minimum I owe my country. And then, uh, um, you know, I, I, my duty towards my family, my duty towards my, uh, my, 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 the, my colleagues in the, in the embassy. I have a duty towards them. Uh, you know, so I, I'm very disciplined as a person. Uh, I'm a daughter of an officer, so an army officer, you understand. You learn these things from early life. Uh, and the fact that I have this sense of duty. Uh, that, I have. I don't belong to the me generation. I belong to the generation that you have to take care of your parents, of your children, uh, to be good to your friends, to be good to your colleagues, uh, and of course to be good to yourself. Uh, but not yourself is not above everything else. Because after all, what's worth in my life if everybody around me are unhappy with me? I mean, what kind of satisfaction I get if my parents are unhappy with me, my friends are unhappy with me, my family is unhappy with me, my colleagues are unhappy with me, I make everybody's life miserable. What kind of satisfaction I get when I say, oh, this is a beautiful life. No, I'm sorry, this is not a beautiful life. And if people don't understand that, and sometimes people say, oh, you sacrifice for others. No, you don't sacrifice for others, it's your choice. So to the fact that it's your choice is not a sacrifice. You choose to do things because you want to see, uh, you know, when my, my son was very young, sometimes I was very tired and still I had to take him to parties with his friends. And, I, I, and then I left him at the house and I fell asleep in the car. And uh, people would say, it's sacrifice. No, it's not sacrifice. The happiness in the face of my son was my reward. So I did it with all my, all my heart. Uh, it was a joy for me. Still, I was very tired, but it was not a sacrifice. So... I don't believe in this, in this word sacrifice. We do things out of choice. And once we choose to do things, huh, it's also for us, re reward for us, not only for the others. And it's so beautiful to choose to do things for the people whom you love or who, with whom you spend most of your life. Um, so uh, for me, this is the, the single characteristic, you know, that I, I, I think helps me in my everyday life because like all people, there are many days that I wake up and say, oh my God, I don't want to go to the office. <laughs> I want to go on vacation like everybody. But um, no, it, it's this sense that uh, I have to do things because I want to do things. In the end, it's my choice. And I'm sorry, I still don't remember the other part of the question. It, one I'm question was... No, that's fine. <laughs> what advice would you give your younger self and what has been the single best factor, biggest factor in your success? The biggest factor I asked, answered, what advice I give my, um, I don't know. It's very hard to, to live my life, anybody's life again. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's okay. I, I, I have learned in my life to be accept. I accept things, I accept even my shortcomings. Uh, uh, and um, I accept the shortcomings of everybody else. Uh, oh, no, it's not that I don't get mad. Uh, I get mad at myself and then a lot. Of, I, I, nobody's perfect. Uh, but I have lost uh, a lot in my life. I have lost people that I loved uh, at a young age. Uh, and after a while, you understand that there is um, life is not eternal. And um, it's no point trying to... to, to, to uh, uh, try to redo things. Uh, um, yes, uh, uh, when I do things that I really feel bad afterwards, I don't mind saying, I'm sorry. Okay, I do things that sometimes I regret and I say, I'm sorry. The rest, no, I don't give advice. I'm against advice in general, as you saw. I'm against advice because each one of us lives his life in his own way. And it's so wrong to give advice 
and I am I'm 65 years old, you know, to go back to when I was 30, but I was a different person when I was 30. And I became who I am at, at, at this age because I had all the experiences up to now with my mistakes, with my good points, my bad points, my horrible points. So what's the point of going back in completely different circumstances? In com I was a all of us are different persons. I, I was different when I was 15, 30, 40. You know, every, every decade has a, a different approach to life. So what's the point of going out to a 30-year-old woman that was completely, <laughs> you know, thought the, the thought other, other, I had a different other view about the world, uh, that, oh, no, no, you should not do that. No, you are the, the combination of, of, of your bad and good points and uh, the experience you had in life and no point to change them. Thank you. This was, this, this was wonderful. Uh, the, the last question is really an invitation, but I think that everyone listening to you today would want you to visit their own communities. But this was from Maria Karayonopoulos from Texas. She has met you before and she wants you to visit her again in Texas. But as I said, everyone listening to you wants you to come to their community. So. I want, to, I want to visit the communities, really. <laughs> I, did, I was not able to do that because of COVID, but now that COVID is going away, I will try to do my best. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Your Excellency Papadopoulou and uh, Mrs. Mutopoulos for taking the time to celebrate International Women's Day with us, the Daughters of Penelope. Your lifelong career in the Foreign and Diplomatic Corps is extensive and diverse. Each appointment building on the previous, your perspective, skills, and experience as a woman helped guide, a, guide you and propel you forward throughout your life's journey. You are a shining example for all of us to emulate. We are grateful recipients for your thoughts and example today. And I'm glad I didn't write the word advice. <laughs> no, please, because, <laughs> because I, you know, each one, you say your opinion, you state your opinion, your point of view and the others are free to do whatever they want to do. That's right. Diane Marie Child was, was quoted in saying, a woman is the full circle. Within her is the power to create, nurture, and transform. You are the living embodiment of this quote, as are the daughters of Penelope. We, may we continue to embrace our womanhood today and every day. May we continue to develop our skills, talents, support and empower each other for the betterment of our communities and society as a whole. Let us remember to let our light shine ever so brightly and stand together with grace and dignity. I wanna extend a special thank you to Elena Saviolakis for um, coordinating this event, working with the ambassador in her office with this event. I hope it's the beginning I hope it is the beginning and a, a continuation of a friendship and a collaboration that will help us develop more Daughters of Penelope and, and community events in the future. Thank you all for participating on behalf of the Grand President and the, all the sisters on the Grand Lodge. We wish you a very happy International Women's Day and let us celebrate our womanhood every day of the year. Thank you so much day. for having me. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thanks uh, for you who organized that and also all the participants. It was a great honor. Thank you.